Welcome to worship this morning. We're the eighth Sunday after Pentecost. It's really great to be with you, uh, with you guys this morning here in person and for those that are on Zoom. Let us stand for the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Let us pray. O oh God, powerful and compassionate, you shepherd your people, faithfully feeding and protecting us. Heal each of us and make us a whole people that lay may embody the justice and peace of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Today, our first reading is from <clears throat> Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter. <clears throat> Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people, it is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, said the Lord, that I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will rise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, 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 and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. 
the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. We should, shall read responsively the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. You restore my soul, O Lord, and guide me along right pathways for your name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup is running over. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our second reading is from the second chapter, or rather Ephesians 2, the second chapter. Remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at the time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you once were far from having been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken, broken down the dividing wall that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself a new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups in God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. Though he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near, for through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens and the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them. And they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to a land at Gesenaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak and all who touched it were healed. The gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord. Maybe you see it. Most people don't set off to get lost. You round the bend of a trail, take a wrong turn on a highway, forget your phone at home or in the office, and suddenly there you are, lost. 
off course, disoriented. Most people get lost for one of a few reasons. They aren't paying attention, they get turned around by something outside themselves, or they are unwilling to admit that they do not know where they are. And I've definitely sometimes been that person. <laughs> but what is curious about being utterly and truly lost to me is the fact that it can often be intensely clarifying. In her book, A Field Guide to Getting Lost, the author, Rebecca Solnit, reflects that often we must get lost in order to see the world in a new way, to draw new connections, make new meaning. We must, in other words, seek out the unexpected, place where the unfamiliar can make itself known. That was certainly true for Father Gregory Boyle, who never expected to find himself in the place of unknowing. Father Gregory Boyle is an author, Jesuit priest, and founder of Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles, California. He became the pastor at Dolores Mission Church, the poorest Catholic parish in LA, located in a community that had the highest concentration of gang violence. It was trial by fire, literally. His entry into the community was marked by what he calls a decade of death, in which he personally buried nearly 200 young victims of gang violence and brutality. The parish also included Aliso Village and Pico Gardens, then the largest public housing projects west of the Mississippi. They also had the greatest concentration of gang activity, and that's saying something given that Los Angeles's reputation as the gang capital of the world. But during this time, law enforcement methods of suppression and criminal justice policies of mass incarceration were the dominant means to deal with gang violence. But where others only saw criminals, Father Gregory saw people in need of help. Homeboy Industries is the biggest gang intervention, rehabilitation and reentry program in the world and welcomes thousands of individuals each year. Some of you might be familiar with Father Gregory's memoir, Tattoos on the Heart. It's in this memoir that Father Gregory reflects on how his initial reaction to the unending violence that inundated his neighborhood was to try to save gang members. He came up with endless job programs, negotiated peace treaties between rival gangs, sought to entice gang members to leave their gangs for a better life. But at some point, he writes, I learned that saving lives is for the Coast Guard. Instead, he was surprised to discover something truly unexpected, that when we go to the places where the vulnerable, the suffering, and the hurting are, we all find rescue. We find that there is no them and us. There is only us. It is in this kinship with weak that God's kingdom is revealed. It is at the margins that we are all transformed, not just those who need healing, but those who go to heal. Consider our text this morning. They exist at the margins, between where we have been and where we think we are going, between who is considered inside the community and outside the community. And in that in-between space, that God reveals what is important. Let's look at our gospel lesson. If you will recall, it's not that long ago that Jesus took his disciples to his hometown where they find that their teaching is unwelcome. Mark's gospel tells us that they took offense at him, which I suppose is preferable to John telling in which Jesus' neighbors and childhood friends receive his words and then invite him to jump off the pinnacle of the temple. And so, Jesus finds himself at the margins of his own community and sends his disciples out to heal the sick and preach the gospel. We're told that their work is fruitful, 
But we also learn at the beginning of our text that the disciples are exhausted. Their work has been good, but they are so busy, they have barely had time to eat. And so they venture with Jesus further into the margins, out into the desert places in search of rest. Unfortunately for them, the crowds of the vulnerable and hurting people do not know that the disciples are on vacation. For no sooner do the disciples push their boat to shore than they are surrounded by ever more people, the need as urgent and unrelenting as before. But something happens in that deserted place, something that changes everything. Scripture tells us that Jesus looked upon the crowds and had compassion for them, for they were like sheep without a shepherd. Now, it is easy to pass over this text because of what comes after. We have the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus walking upon the water will soon follow and can easily overshadow what seems like a brief transitional moment in this journey with Christ. But consider the miracle of this moment. In the midst of their exhaustion and depletion, Jesus responds in a way that helps his disciples to recognize the common suffering and humanity of these hurting, broken people. In that moment, they are all invited into kinship with the crowds, with their struggle, with their exhaustion, with their need. Boyle writes in his book, the strategy of Jesus is not centered in taking the right stand on issues, but rather in standing in the right place with the outcast and those relegated to the margins. He goes on to say that what we seek is a compassion that can stand in awe at what the poor have to carry rather than stand in judgment at how they carry it. Here we see the disciples are invited to see themselves for what they truly are, a community of broken and needy people who are all in need of rest that only God can provide. In that moment, in the midst of that, Jesus provides the gift that only God can give us in our lowest moments. He tends to the crowd so that his disciples can rest. He offers his brothers and friends the gift of solidarity with the very people they have been sent to serve. He reminds them that all of us, helper and helped, insider and out, are in need of rest that only the Good Shepherd can provide. And this is no small moment. Here in the desert, which in Jewish tradition is a place of struggle and testing, the disciples are invited to test the limits of their understanding of discipleship and to form true and abiding community and kinship with the house of God. It is a glimpse of the kingdom of God that will continue to unfold as together the disciples journey with Christ towards the cross and into the new hope of resurrection. No longer can they stand apart from the people for the wall between them is broken and healed and healer have been thrown down and what has emerged is a new fellowship of mutual suffering and understanding that will find its fullest expression in the early church. But the truth is, that is just the beginning. For in the letter to the Ephesians, we know that how this fledging kinship continues to challenge the followers of Jesus as it, as it expands and widens its net to include those who were once far off. The kingdom of God refuses to countenance the walls that we erect between ourselves and those whom we have labeled as outside ourselves. And so this time it is the Apostle Paul 
who finds himself in the unexpected place, discovering kinship with the Gentile Christians. For in his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. The cost of following Christ is tearing down the convenient barriers that kept us apart and engaging in the messy work of truly mutual life together. And truly, the work is messy. Paul's mission to the Gentiles puts him at odds with the rest of the early church. His ministry is continually questioned, his call mistrusted by those who are comfortable with the way things were. But he stands firm in the knowledge that Jesus did not choose the easy path. His ministry, too, is marked by conflict with those who are content with things as they are, those who would prefer that those at the margins, tax collectors, Samaritans, sinners, prostitutes, stay exactly where they are. Now, I don't recall who said this exactly, but there was a theologian who said that the work of theology is not reserved for the seminary educated. To be a, a theologian, she said, is simply to expect God to show up and do something. And so I believe the question for us this morning is this. What do we expect God to do with the walls that we have built for ourselves? What unexpected places in God's spirit leading us to that we might experience healing, challenge, and transformation? Where might we need to get lost for a while so that we can see differently? The Reverend Tracy Blackman currently serves as the Executive Minister of Justice and Local Church Ministries for the UCC. But you may have heard of her because she was the face of the church in Ferguson, Missouri, during the aftermath of the Michael Brown murder. She and other sheroes, as I like to call them, answered the call of the afflicted in those days, heading out to the streets and finding solidarity with the suffering and the forsaken. These bold Christians offered solidarity, hospitality, and healing to people when it seemed that they had been forgotten and dispossessed. Reverend Tracy reflected at a young women's clergy conference that the task of the church is to open our doors to our communities, to listen to the voices of the suffering, and to put the afflicted at the center of our work and our worship because they are the ones in the most pain, and that is what Christ did. She reminded those in attendance that their task was to listen to the margins, to pay attention, because they might just find that the margins have something important to teach them. When we do that, it may at first seem like things are getting worse, but the truth is, when we practice kinship with the suffering, we are merely uncovering what was already there to begin with. We just needed to get lost enough to see it for ourselves. We are bearing witness to the lived experience of God's people, and that, my friends, is exactly where healing begins. For we cannot be healed until we understand what we, what we are suffering from. There are many walls that we have erected around ourselves, walls that keep us apart from our siblings who differ economically, culturally, racially, spiritually, politically. But these walls do not serve us. They are killing the movement of God's spirit in the world. But they are no match for the Good Shepherd who breaks down the dividing wall and in its place builds a foundation for the kingdom of God in which all the sheep of God's pasture find rest and healing and peace. May we be brave enough to put ourselves in the unexpected place where God is even now building something new, not a wall, but a bridge that may help us see that there is nothing 
that separates us from our siblings, but our own unwillingness to meet them in the place where God's spirit dwells. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Rooted in Christ and sustained by the Spirit, we offer our prayers for the Church, the world, and all of creation. Tend your church, O oh God. Encourage bishops, pastors, and deacons in their proclamation of the gospel. Raise up new leaders and encourage those pursuing a call to ministry. Embolden all the baptized to embody your love and justice. Hear us, O oh God. Restore your creation, O oh God. Sustain croplands and pastures and safeguard all farm animals and livestock. Preserve lakes, rivers, and streams that offer refreshment. Revive lands recovering from natural disasters and protect coastlands threatened by rising oceans. Hear us, O oh God. Reconcile the nations, O oh God. Break down the dividing walls that make us strangers to one another and unite us as one human family. Equip leaders to deal wisely with conflict and guide diplomats who seek peaceful solutions. Hear us, O oh God. Heal your people, O oh God. Look with compassion on immigrants, exiles, and all who are afraid or feel lost. Give rest to those who are weary, comfort to those who are grieving, and recovering to those who are ill, especially Patty, Dorothy, Donald, Sarah, Betsy, the Wetzel family, Jim, Carol and Carl, Lily, Jan, Dolores, 
Brandon and Bobby, Vincent and Joanne, Jack, Bill, Drew, Ruby and Miles, Steph, Mark, Dave, Matt, Linda, Luciano, Jane and George, Hedy, Dan, Sue, Kathy, Lou, and Bill. Hear us, O oh God. Nourish this congregation, O oh God. Prepare a table where we receive food for our hungering spirits. Renew our commitment to provide for one another and revitalize our ministries of feeding and nurturing hungry neighbors. Hear us, O oh God. You lead us home, O oh God. We give thanks for all who have died, now citizens with the saints. As you have received them into your heavenly home, so welcome all of us to dwell in your house forever. Hear us, O oh God. We lift these and all of our prayers to you, O oh God, confident in the promise of your saving love through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The peace of Christ be with you always. Let us pray. God of all creation, all you have made is good and your love endures forever. You bring forth bread from the earth and fruit from the vine. 
Nourish us with these gifts that we might be for the world signs of your gracious presence in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Glory to you, O God, for your creative word, making and mending all things, evoking the cosmic hymn of praise, and singing a love song for your beloved, your vineyard, your flock, your people. With all creation, we sing glory. glory. Blessed are you for your liberating word, speaking through Moses and the prophets, encountered in the gospels and proclaimed in the assembly, your freedom, forgiveness, and life for the world. With the whole world, we say blessing. blessing. Holy are you, O God, for your living word. Among us, wherever we gather, welcoming everyone to your feast and with grace and generosity, bringing to earth the kingdom of heaven. With saints and angels, we cry, holy. holy. Clothe us in your loving spirit, flowing from the crucified and risen one, and keep us awake to your presence in the people and places you call us to serve. Glory, praise, and blessing are yours, holy God, now and forever. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I must the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. We first off for the announcements today, we'd like to welcome Sarah Humphrey and thank her for being with us today. Uh, this past Wednesday, we fed the hungry. Thank you to Keith and Maureen Jones who uh, made arrangements for everything uh, and had things delivered. There were the toiletries that we had been collecting. They have now been delivered to the Life Center as well as dinner those who helped and or volunteered and weren't needed this time, but maybe next time, Butch Wessel, Kevin Hartman, Gene Dorshu, George Marango, John Lyon, and Steve Young. Our fitness classes have resumed in the parking lot taught by Deanna Stesey. Uh, they started yesterday and registration uh, can be gotten through the office. On July 25th, we will be hosting the coffee hour for the Welcome Church in Center City. Following worship that day, we will be gathering for lunch, which will be provided, and assembling snack bags. We will then be carpooling to Philadelphia to worship with the Welcome Church outdoors, rain or shine. You are welcome to participate in all or some of the day. Maybe you can stay for lunch and help assemble the snack bags, or maybe you want to meet up with us before we go to Center City. Any and all help is appreciated. Thanks to all who brought in those toiletries for the Life Center. The people at the Life Center greatly appreciate your generosity. We have uh, just one ongoing collection at this point. We've uh, satisfied the last two. Uh, we are collecting school supplies again this year. There are lists of items needed that you can take uh, in the Northex, and there is a box there to put things in as you buy them. You can also order online through Amazon and have the items sent directly to those who will be putting the backpacks together. Or you can make a check payable to Grace Lutheran Church and put a note that it is for uh, the uh, school supplies and put it in the offering plate or mail it to the church. 
Are there any other announcements for the community or from the community today? Are there any uh, repair, prayer requests or updates? Thank you very much. You can rise to receive the final blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Share the good news. Thanks be to God.